How's it going everyone? This is Ideas of Ice and Fire. If you would like to support this channel, please subscribe and check out my Patreon. And also follow me on social media, Facebook and Twitter. All links are on the screen and also in the description. Today we are going to be focusing on Yeeti and some of its more famous legendary figures. Let's take a look at what the world of Ice and Fire has to say about Yeeti. A fabled land. Even in the Seven Kingdoms, Yiti is a large and diverse country, a realm of wind-swept plains and rolling hills, jungles and rainforest, deep lakes and rushing rivers, and shrinking island seas. Its legendary wealth is such as to allow its princes to live in houses of solid gold and dine on sweet meats powdered with pearls and jade. Lummis Longstrider, awestruck by its marvels, called Yi Ti the land of a thousand gods and a hundred princes, ruled by one god emperor. Those who have visited Yi Ti, as it is today, tell us that the thousand gods and hundred princes yet remain. But there are three god emperors, each claiming the right to don the gowns and cloth of gold, green pearls and jade that tradition allows to the emperor alone, none wields true power. Though millions may worship the Azure Emperor in Yin and prostrate themselves before him when he appears, his imperial writ extends no further than the walls of his own city. The hundred princes of whom Lamas Longstrider wrote rule their own realms as they please, as do the brigands, priest kings, sorcerers, warlords, and imperial generals and tax collectors outside their domains. This was not always so, we know. In ancient days the god emperors of Yi Ti were as powerful as any ruler on earth, with wealth that exceeded that of even Valyria at its height, and armies of almost unimaginable size. In the beginning, the priestly scribes of Yin declare, all the lands between the bones and the freezing desert called the Grey Waste, from the Shivering Sea to the Jade Sea, including even the great and holy Isle of Ling, formed a single realm ruled by the god on earth, the only begotten son of the Lion of Night and the Maiden of Light, who traveled about his domains in a palakin carved from a single pearl and carried by a hundred queens, his wives. For ten thousand years the great empire of the dawn flourished in peace and plenty under the god on earth, until at last he ascended to the stars to join his forebearers. Dominion over mankind then passed to his eldest son, who was known as the Pearl Emperor and ruled for a thousand years. The Jade Emperor, the Tourmaline Emperor, the Onyx Emperor, the Topaz Emperor, the Opal Emperor followed in turn, each reigning for centuries. Yet, every reign was shorter and more troubled than the one preceding it. For wild men and baleful beast pressed at the borders of the great empire. Lesser kings grew prideful and rebellious, and common people gave themselves over to adverse envy, lust, murder, incest, gluttony, and sloth. When the daughter of the Opal Emperor succeeded him as the Amethyst Empress, her envious younger brother cast her down and slew her, proclaiming himself the Bloodstone Emperor and beginning a reign of terror. He practiced dark arts, torture, and necromancy, enslaved his people, took a tiger woman for his bride, feasted on the flesh of humans, and cast down the true gods to worship a black stone that had fallen from the sky. Many scholars count the Bloodstone Emperor as the first high priest of the sinister Church of the Starry Wisdom, which persists to this day in many port cities throughout the known world. In the annals of the further east, it was the blood betrayal and his usurpation is named that ushered the age of darkness called the Long Night. Despairing of the evil that had been unleashed on the earth, the Maiden of Light turned her back upon the world, and the Lion of Night came forth in all his wrath to punish the wickedness of men. How long the darkness endured no man can say, 
but all agree that it was only when a great warrior, known variously as Hakrun the Hero, Azor Ahai, Yin Ti, Nefarion, and Eldric Shadow Chaser, arose to give courage to the race of men and lead the virtuous battle with his blazing sword Lightbringer, that the darkness was put to rout and light and love returned once more to the world. Yet the great empire of the dawn was not reborn. For the restored world was a broken place, where every tribe of men went its own way, fearful of all the others, and war and lust and murder endured even to the present day, or so the men and women of the further east believe. At the citadel of Old Town and other centers of learning in the west, Maesters regard these tales of the great empire and its fall as legends, not history. Yet none doubt that the Yeetish civilization is ancient, mayhap even contemporary with the realms of the Fisher Queen beside the Silver Sea. In Yeeti itself, the priest insists that mankind's first towns and cities arose along the shores of the Jade Sea and dismissed the rival claims of the Sarnar and the Gis as the boast of savages and children. Whatever the truth, Yi Ti was beyond question one of the places where men first climbed from the pit of savagery into civilization and literacy. For the wise men of the East have been reading and writing for many thousands of years. Their most ancient records are cherished, almost venerated, but are also jealously guarded by their scholars. Such accounts as we have are pieced together from hearsay, from travelers and scattered text that have escaped E.T. to find their way across the seas to the citadel. To tell the tale of E.T is far beyond our scope here. Comprising it does hundreds of emperors and myriad wars and conquest and rebellions. Let suffice to say, the Golden Empire has known golden ages and dark ages, that it has waxed and waned and waxed again throughout the centuries, that it has weathered floods and droughts and sandstorms and the quaking of the earth so violent as to shallow entire cities, that thousands of heroes and cravens and concubines and wizards and scholars have passed across the pages of its histories. Since the further east emerged from the long night and the centuries of chaos that followed, eleven dynasties have held sway over the lands we now call Yi Ti. Some lasted no more than half a century, the longest endured for seven hundred years. Some dynasties gave way to others peacefully, others with blood and steel. On four occasions, the end of a dynasty was followed by a period of anarchy and lawlessness when warlords and petty kings warred with one another for supremacy. The longest of these interrogums lasted more than a century. Though Yi Ti is a vast land, much of it is covered by dense forest, sweltering jungles, Travel from one end of the empire to the other is swift and safe, for the great web of stone roads built by the eunuch emperors of old have no equal in all the world, save for the dragon roads of the Valyrians. The cities of Yi Ti are far famed as well, for no other land can boast so many. If Lamas Longstrider can be believed, None of the cities of the West can compare to those of Yi Ti in size and splendor. Even their ruins put ours to shame, the Longstrider said, and ruins are everywhere in Yi Ti. In his Jade Compendion, Kalakuo Vatar, the best source available in Westeros on the lands of the Jade Sea, wrote that beneath every Yeetish city, three older cities lie buried. Over the centuries, the capital of the Golden Empire has moved here and there and back again a score of times. As rival warlords contended and dynasties rose and fell, the Grey Emperors, Indigo Emperors, and Pearl White Emperors ruled from Yin on the shores of the Jade Sea, first and most glorious of Yeetish cities. But the Scarlet Emperors raised up a new city in the heart of the jungle and named it Sequo, the Glorious 
long fallen and overgrown, its glory lives now only in legend. Whilst the purple emperors referred to Tiqui, the many-towered city in the western hills, and the maroon emperors kept their martial court in Jinqui, the better to guard the frontiers of the empire against reavers from the Shadowlands. Today Yin is once more the capital of Yi Ti. There, the 17th Azure Emperor, Buga, sits in splendor in a palace larger than all King's Landing. Yet far to the east, well beyond the borders of the Golden Empire proper, past the legendary mountains of the Morn, in the city Carcosa on the Hidden Sea, dwells in exile a sorcerer lord who claims to be the 69th Yellow Emperor from a dynasty fallen for a thousand years. And more recently, a general named Pol Kuo, Hammer of the Jogos Nai, has given himself imperial honors, naming himself the first of the Orange Emperors, with the rude, sprawling garrison city called the Trader Town, his capital. Which of these three emperors will prevail is a question best left for historians of years to come. No discussion of Yi Ti would be complete without a mention of the Five Forts, a line of hulking ancient citadels that stand along the far northern eastern frontiers of the Golden Empire between the Bleeding Sea named for the characteristic hue of its deep waters, supposedly the result of the plant that grows only there, and the mountains of the morn. The five forts are very old, older than the Golden Empire itself. Some claim they were raised by the Pearl Emperor during the morning of the Great Empire to keep the Lion of Night and his demons from the realms of men, and indeed, there is something godlike or demonic about the monstrous size of the forts, for each of the five is large enough to house ten thousand men, and their massive walls stand almost a thousand feet high. Certain scholars from the west have suggested Valyrian involvement in the construction of the five forts, for the great walls are single slabs of fused black stone that resemble certain Valyrian citadels in the west, but it seems unlikely, for the forts predate the Freehold's rise, and there is no record of any dragon lords ever coming so far east. Thus the five forts remain a mystery, and still stand today unmarked by time, guarding the marches of the Golden Empire against raiders out of the Grey Waste. Of the lands that lie beyond the five forts, we know even less. Legend and lies and travelers' tales are all that ever reach us of these far places. We hear of cities where men soar like eagles on leathered wings, of towns made of bones, and of a race of bloodless men who dwell between the deep valley called the Dry Deep and the mountains. Whispers of the gray waste and its cannibal sands, and of the shrieks who live there, half-human creatures, green-scaled skin, and venomous bites. Are these truly lizard men, or more likely, men clad in the skin of lizards? Or are they no more than fables, the grumpkins and snarks of the eastern deserts? And even the shrieks supposedly live in terror of Kadath, in the gray waste, a city said to be older than time, where unspeakable rites are performed to slake the hunger of mad gods. Does such a city truly exist? If so, what is its nature? On such matters, even Lomas Longstrider is silent. Perhaps the priest of Yiti know, but if so, these are not truths they care to share with us. And that is what the World of Ice and Fire has to say about Yi T. Now before I start responding to you guys' comments, I'm going to play you guys my video from last year on the five forts of Yi T because it is relevant to some other things that I would like to discuss today. Far east within the ancient kingdom of Yi T lie the five forts. 
The five forts each are large enough to house 10,000 men, and their massive walls stand nearly a thousand feet high. The five forts in E.T. are still used to this day to guard the Golden Empire from raiders out of the Great Wastes which lies beyond. The five forts lie between the Bleeding Sea and the Mountains of the Morn. They effectively block anything from entering E.T. from the further east. No one knows what lies beyond the Grey Waste, and the forts are said to give off an aura of something godlike or demonic, seemingly as though there is ancient power behind them. They are made entirely of smooth black stone that is still to this day unmarked by time. The Bloodstone Emperor of UT was said to have cast aside his true gods to worship a black stone that had fallen from the sky. He practiced dark magic, necromancy, torture, and feasted on the flesh of humans. He was said to have taken a tiger woman for his bride. Many scholars believe that Bloodstone was the first high priest of the sinister church of the Starry Wisdom, which according to the world of ice and fire, still persists till this day. The Black Stone as well as the Starry Wisdom are direct references to Lovecraftian lore. In H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos, the Church of the Starry Wisdom is a cult that worships Narlatet, the Haunter of the Dark. Martin references Lovecraft a lot in A Song of Ice and Fire. There is too much to discuss here, so this will be the topic of future videos. Bloodstone may mirror the Night's King, the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, who took a corpse woman to bride and made blood sacrifices to strange gods. In the Annals of the Fur East, it is said that it was Bloodstone's betrayal of his sister, whom he had usurped to become Emperor, and the terror that he unleashed upon his people that led to the Long Night. They speak in the East of a hero who wielded the flaming sword called Lightbringer, so that light and love could return yet again. But according to the people of the Far East and Yiti, the world has been a broken place since then. The way the five forts which block off Yiti and effectively the rest of Essos from the frozen desert known only as the Grey Waste is extraordinarily similar to the way the Ice Wall in the north of Westeros blocks the Seven Kingdoms off from the land of Always Winter and the Haunted Forest beyond. The five forts are even said to have been raised to keep the Lion of Night and his demons from the realms of men, just like the legends of the Wall claim that it was built to keep the others from the realms of men. Both Essos and Westeros have giant barriers in place to guard off some threat, a threat which apparently made its initial appearance during the Long Night and affected both sides of the world. But how is that possible? The others came out of the north of Westeros, far from within the land of Always Winter. That's on the other side of the world. East of Yiti is the frozen grey waste, and then, well, we don't know. We haven't seen the rest of the map. Assuming that the planet is round, there has to be a place where the two sides meet. What if the grey waste of Essos and the far north of Westeros are connected? And when the long night happened, the others invaded not only Westeros, but Essos as well. This would explain why the stories of the Long Night and the Last Hero extend far beyond Westeros. In every part of the world, there are tales of the warrior that led men to victory. Hycroon, the hero, Nefirion, Azor Ahai, Yin Tar, Eldric Shadow Chaser, all are different names for the hero who fought the darkness. If the others did attack from both directions, then it seems as though there would have had to have been more than one hero. Perhaps one in Westeros and one in Essos. Through time, the legends made them one. One hero of many names that fought for the dawn. In Westeros, it was the children who helped men build the Great Wall of Ice to keep the others out. But who erected the five forts? The oily black stone that they are made of appears throughout all of Westeros and Essos. The Sea Stone Chair. The Idol of Toad Isle. The Mazes of Lorath always unexplained, always of unknown origin. The biggest hints that we have relate to the sea stone chair of the Iron Islands and the idol of Toad Isle. The drowned god is worshipped on the Iron Islands. This religion seems to be heavily inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos. That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and which strange eons even death may die. H.P. Lovecraft, The Call of Cthulhu. What is dead may never die, but rises again harder and stronger. George R. R. Martin, A Song of Ice and Fire Upon closer inspection of their history, yet another reference to Lovecraft can be found. 
Maester Therion of the Iron Islands wrote in his manuscript that the sea stone chair was created by a race of half-fish, half-humans known as the Deep Ones. These creatures are directly borrowed from Lovecraftian mythology. In the Cthulhu mythos, they are a sea-dwelling part man, part fish creature with webbed hands and webbed feet. They are worshippers of the god Cthulhu, and they also have a fondness for mating with humans. On the island of Toads, the worshippers of the Toad idol are thought to be descended from those who carved it. They are said to have an unpleasant fish-like appearance to their face, and many have webbed feet and webbed hands. Is it possible that the people of Toad Isle are truly descended from the Deep Ones? Bleeding Sea lies north of the Five Forts, and the Mountains of the Morn and the Shadowlands further south. Together they form a barrier that separates the Grey Wastes from the rest of Essos. Could the Bleeding Sea be the dwelling place of the Deep Ones? Or at least one of their dwelling places? The Black Stone appears throughout all the world, which makes sense because the Deep Ones are intelligent water-dwelling beings. They simply could swim to a different part of the world and disappear without a trace beneath the sea. Was it the Deep Ones that built the Five Forts? And do they still lurk within the Bleeding Sea to this day? With all of our attention focused on the north of Westeros, we've forgotten about the Far East, which just as little is known of. If the others came both way last time, why would they not again? Perhaps the Deep Ones knew they may come again so they helped build the forts to guard the realm. There has to be a savior in Essos and there has to be a savior in Westeros. Danny seems to be the best candidate for Essos and Quaith tells her that to go west she must go east. This makes perfect sense if they connect on the other side. As for Westeros, Bran seems like the most likely candidate in my opinion. Whoever the heroes are, it is now clear to me that the same story played out on both Essos and Westeros thousands of years ago. The long night came, the last hero saved the world, and a barrier was erected with the help of non-human beings. These parallels when examined seem to suggest that we must not only look north when the winter comes, but east as well. Now a problem that a lot of people have when I uh, tell them about this theory is they say that, well George R. R. Martin has said in the past that the continents are not connected. Well, what I would suggest is that possibly during the winter, it would ice over and create a kind of bridge. And you know, this is something that has happened in the real world. It is believed that the first humans got to North America by way of an ice bridge. And then, of course, the Five Forts and the Wall and the story of the Lion of Night um, and the stories of the White Walkers and the others is all, to me, quite strikingly similar. And then it's also said that the Five Forts are still used to uh, defend the Empire from raiders out of the Great Waste, just like the Wall is still used to defend the realm from wildling raiders. I mean, it's all very, very similar. George R. R. Martin is definitely trying to make you think of the Wall here. And then I also thought that it would be super interesting if since it was the Children of the Forest and the Giants, um, non-human creatures that help men build the wall in Westeros, that it would be interesting if the Deep Ones were actually responsible for helping uh, the people of the Great Empire or whoever build the Five Forts uh, in over in the East. And then I thought that the Bleeding Sea is perfect because it's got this weird uh, plant that grows here that makes it red. And I thought it was perfect because Deep Ones could still be there. They could still be dwelling in the Bleeding Sea. What's interesting is both parts of the world are cut off. They're cut off on the edges. Westeros is cut off on the edge and Essos is cut off on the edge and they're both blocking. They're, they're, they're defending themselves against something. We know what the people of Westeros are defending themselves against. We can't see the other side of the world. I mean, it seems like this is where it's pointed. But then again, I've come to realize that it says that the five forts may have actually been built before the Great Empire even was built. So then I'd have to speculate that maybe even the others attacked Yi T before they ever even attacked Westeros. Or maybe it's not even the others as we understand them. Some other great threat similar to the others probably. Going back to my grand game theory, there would be multiple players representative of maybe different elements in this world. Ice being one, fire being one, maybe it was another player, maybe it attacked uh, that area, the Empire, and then the Five Forts were built to fend off against that, whatever it might have been. I think it's very telling that the city in the Grey Waste is known as Kadath, 
which is uh, an ancient castle in, in Lovecraftian lore. It's in another dimension. It's where the old, the great old ones live, um, who are, you know, some of the deities that, you know, exist in that universe. De the, well, in Lovecraftian lore, deities aren't really deities. They're just beings that are super beyond human understanding. And so they might as well be deities. I talk in my video, uh, my other video on ET that I did, about how I believe that the Dawn Emperor was literally from the stars, and when he died, he literally reascended into the stars, and that he was, you know, the first of these beings to ever come to this planet. Uh, he was the first, and after he left, other beings came, and you know, that's kind of represented, that's kind of represented by the Bloodstone, you know? It dropped this stone, and you know, the Bloodstone Emperor is worshipping this entity, this new deity that saw the vacancy that the god emperor of the dawn left left he saw the vacancy that these humans were left unattended and you know other beings just kind of swarmed in and now they're playing their own kind of game with the people of you know planetos this world yes it is a very lovecraftian idea it's based off of the lovecraftian references that i find all over the place but i think it's an interesting way to look at the series it gives you an entire a uh, new look and how why things are really happening the way they are happening and I think it's very interesting interesting to think about I'm not saying that it's 100% true but it's something that I definitely like to theorize about and think about a lot now one more thing before I get to looking at the comment section and taking you guys' questions I got to show you guys the quote unquote trailer for my Dune Ultimate Guide series it's coming out um, in a few days, and I have, you know, kind of a little snippet here for you guys to give you a taste of what it's going to be like. So here that is. Once, men turned their thinking over to machines in the hope that this would set them free. But that only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. Frank Herbert, Dune. History is written on the sands of Arrakis. Get ready for the greatest guide to Dune that you've ever needed, wanted, or seen. I put a lot of effort into this, and I'm very hoping, I'm really hoping that you guys like it. Like, I'm, I'm like biting my nails, because um, I know a lot of people can't really get into Dune, because it's like really fucking dense. It's like, it's hard sci-fi. It's very hard sci-fi. But I am here to guide you, and it's going to be in seven parts. We're going to start with a beginner's guide, and then we're going to do all six of Frank Herbert's books. It's going to be a lot of fun, and if they're well-received, then maybe I might even go into Brian, Brian Herbert's Extended Universe's book. Extended Universe book because, you know, the last Dune book kind of ends on a cliffhanger because Frank Herbert died. And so his son, Brian, kind of continues it. But, you know, a lot of fans don't kind of view that as canon and it's whatever. But that's Dune, the greatest sci-fi series that's ever written. And yeah, so look for that in a few days. But right now, I'm looking at the comments. Shoot me with your comments, guys. I'm finally looking. I'm not kidding. I'm looking. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I worked really hard on that Dune thing. I'm, like, super excited about it. Uh, it'll be out in a few days, like I said. It's going to be so much fun. Like, I personally can't wait for everyone to see it. But, yeah, I'm going to talk about... Later on, I'm going to talk about some Euron Greyjoy, and I'm going to get more into the Bloodstone Emperor. And... Because uh, I think those two characters parallel. But right now, I'm going to look at the comment section before I do that. And get you guys' comments on anything that the World of Ice and Fire said about E.T. I know that LML wanted me to um mention that the great emperor the great empire of the dawn and et are not the same right it's like uh it, back in the day before the long night it was the great empire of the dawn but after that the, it was broken so et is et refers to something different um just so everyone knows so the bloodstone emperor would have technically been of the empire of the dawn but you know 
uh, what it, I guess he ruled in what was current in part in what was currently E.T. and then it was even more back in the day. Opinions on Dune video games. I've never played any of the video games. What you were describing about Icebridge just reminded me of Durgaland as well as Sundra and Suol. I don't know what those are. <laughs> I guess I'm uneducated. How do you feel about the Dune movie? Uh, the David Lynch's Dune movie, I, I enjoy it for what it is. Um, but you can't. It's just not. I'd say like the first hour of it is pretty decent. And then like after that, they really rush through the rest of the story and it just doesn't work. Uh, that Dune vid looks sweet. I actually don't know a thing about Dune, however. Sounds worth the read. Well, you can watch my videos and it'll totally it'll give you everything that you need to know. Definitely will. Definitely will. Uh, E.T. is basically the cultural descendant of the Great Empire of the Dawn. Essentially. Like, I, I, I would agree with that statement, definitely. Does Dune really qualify as hard science fiction? Uh, I think so. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I think so. Well, I guess the title of this video is Bloodstone Emperor. Uh, so you heard in that, uh, in that clip when I was reading from The World of Ice and Fire that the Bloodstone Emperor, uh, usurped his own sister. He slew his older sister and took her throne and he worshipped a black stone that fell from the sky and the stone corrupted him. Um, he worshipped strange gods and did all types of sorcery and torture and sacrifice. And I did compare it to uh, the Night King, uh, the story of the Night King from the Night Fort who found this bride, this ice woman, and he started worshipping strange gods and making sacrifices and all that and all that stuff. It's very similar. And then I move forward and I talk about Euron Greyjoy, how, you know, we talk about his blood eye, which sounds very similar to Bloodstone to me. And him, again, strange gods, strange sacrifices. Uh, it's the same thing again. Um, what I tend to think, it, it all ties back into my grand game theory. I tend to think that the stone that the that the Bloodstone Emperor found um, represented a higher force, um, a different a, a being of sorts that corrupted him, and that kind of the uh, the evil of it kind of spread through him, and it was allowed to spread through him. And I think a very similar thing is happening with uh, Euron Greyjoy. I think that he came across the comet. I think that a piece of that comet is in his eye, and it's the blood eye. And I think yeah, it's spreading its will through him. It's performing actions through Euron in the same way that whatever before performed actions through the Bloodstone Emperor. Uh, and okay, so who is the Tiger Woman? A child of the forest or, or woman of Ling? Uh, we can assume that it's some Eastern woman. Uh, I don't think I don't think it's, it might not be literally a Tiger Woman. So it's probably a woman of Ling, definitely probably something like that. But what it's implying is that whoever the tiger woman was, it's implying that it was, it's kind of unapproved. But he did something that was unapproved of by marrying this quote-unquote tiger woman. Do you think the black oily stone has some sort of coinc consciousness to it, um, almost like op opposite werewood net? Um, I think that's an interesting way to think about it. I'm not certain if it does or not. I do think it kind of has an aura to it, like a, a, a soul um, that radiates a kind of terror or evil. Um, or malignness. And I also want to say in that earlier video, there are a few mistakes in it. Uh, the mazes of Lorath aren't made of the same fused stone. So, and yeah, and I don't know if it's mentioned that the fused stone of the uh, forts is actually oily or not, but it's definitely the fused stone that puts people in the mind of Valyria. Like it says that um, Valyria is the only place. Uh, where this type of stuff is found. And I thought, and there are several comparisons between uh, Yi the Emperor in the Empire of the Dawn to Valyria. We talk about how the roads are built and how they have no rival other than the Valyrian roads. So that's very interesting. So that kind of implies, you know, maybe like a shared technology, a shared technique. Like they both knew how to do this. So maybe, um, so they would imply that either. Ye the people of the Dawn Empire got this knowledge from the same place as the people of Valyria, or that the people of Valyria got this knowledge from the people of the Dawn Empire. They somehow got a hold of this lost knowledge 
and figured out how to do it for themselves in some way. Can you comment on why Hakron the hero is portrayed as white whereas he comes from Yi Ti? Um, distinctly, I mean, I have no idea. I didn't, I didn't draw the art, so I don't know. Let's see. What do you think Arya in the book will do? Will she go back home or something completely different from the show Arya? I think that Arya will eventually go home. I think that it's very clear that Arya is not no one. The simple fact that she hides a needle and keeps it proves that she is still Arya Stark. She will always be Arya Stark. And the, fa and the simple fact that Nymeria lives and that Arya dreams of her is just the ties back to her old life. She will always be Arya Stark. She will return to Westeros. Um, I am certain of that, and I've been certain of that. I said that well before uh, this season or last season. I've always known that Arya would return to Westeros because it is her home. It's where she belongs. She does not belong with the Faces Men. She will never be no one. And that is just my opinion. Is there some entity that may be seeing through Euron's blood eye? Uh, I definitely think so. I think it is definitely watching the world through him. That's why it's there. And, you know, people that have seen it have said how terrible it was to behold. And, of course, if you're looking at some Lovecraftian being, it's going to mess with your head. That's what they do. You can't just look into the dead lights, so to speak, and be okay. You can't. You absolutely cannot. So I think something is watching through him. And it kind of radiates the evil, too. That's kind of... It radiates it to him and to around him. You know you know it's there. You can feel it. People that are around him can feel it. What could have caused... Even caused the Bloodstone to usurp the Amethyst Empress? Could something like the Dance of Dragons have also occurred in the Great Empire? Well... According to legend, men just got more and more selfish, and baleful beasts pressed at the borders of their empire. To me, what this is, it's the influence of malign forces from beyond. That's what's happened. Like, because, you know, these beings always spread anxiety and angst uh, amongst just humanity. It, it, that's what they do. And the fact that Kadath, which is <laughs> love, the lo loves crafts, it's the home of the great old ones is right outside of the five forts um that just says to me yes this is where these beings landed they saw the vacancy that this guy left they came here and they spread chaos throughout ut and they turned brother against sister that's what happened brother was turned against sister and he, he was under the influence of something else this was the coming of the great old ones it at the rise of the empire emperor of the dawn when he ascended into the stars this was the coming of the great old ones i like to think and if not literally, then thematically. <laughs> but I think it's fun to think about it thematically, too. Because, see, that's the thing. George R. R. Martin has more Lovecraft references than anyone else. I mean, there are the Robert Jordan uh, references, and there are the Tolkien references. But there are more Lovecraft references than any of these combined. They're, they're, it's all over the place. It's just splattered. And I just feel like George R. R. Martin, who is a big fan of Lovecraft... And, like, I've heard him talk about Lovecraft before, so he's a big fan. I feel like he put these here to, like, kind of hint at things that are uh, that are going on behind the scenes. So they'll probably, the magnifying glass will never be focused entirely on what's going on here. Mm-hmm. Let's see. I just wanted to say thanks for all your hard work. Much appreciated. Well, thank you for watching. Um, it's always appreciated. And, by the way, if you're watching right now, uh, feel free to give a like if you've been enjoying the conversation so far. The likes really help out, so just thumbs up. You know, if you're not on the page, just like click back real quick and just give a thumbs up. It'll help out a lot. So thanks for that. Thanks everyone that's thumbsing up right now. Okay. I also like the idea that the Valyrians descended from the Amethyst Empress. It would explain Danny seeing ancestors with eyes of gemstone emperors. Um, that is a cool idea. I think LML talks about that a little bit um and yeah so we know that the valyrians somehow came across this technology so they must have been visited by someone that gave them this technology so someone descended from the amethyst emperor empress that maybe had some of this knowledge going to the valyrians and creating this empire that that makes sense it's almost that that almost makes two sense so i do think that is an interesting theory and, that, and that's definitely something we can talk about and think about and discuss very very interesting 
Okay. If HBO were to do a spinoff about E.T., who would you want to play the Bloodstone Emperor? Um, I don't know. That's a very interesting question. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to sit back and think about it for a while. I mean, I, I get, like, when I think, when I think about the Bloodstone Emperor, I mean, I don't, I see, that's the thing. I don't want to sound like, I don't want to sound racist or anything, but I don't know that many Asian actors that are currently in Hollywood. So I, I feel like it would need to be an unknown, right? I mean, I know there are Asian actors, but I, don't, I can't think of one that would fit, you know, this image that I have of the Bloodstone Emperor. So I think it would probably be best if they cast someone that was not really known at all. And that's how and that's how they did for this show. Like the only people that were known in this show in Game of Thrones were Peter Dinklage and and um, Sean Bean, basically. And everyone else was pretty much new. Uh, Amelia Clark was just out of acting school. This was like her first job. And then like I I'd never seen Kit Harrington before. Like I'd never seen. I think I'd seen Viserys in Doctor Who actually. <laughs> like the actor that played Viserys was in a few episodes of Doctor Who, and then you know. A lot of Game of Thrones actors here in Doctor Who, by the way. Uh, no, not George George Takei. That'd be interesting. It'd be interesting to see George Takei as as Bloodstone. Jackie Chan, no. <laughs> be terrible, Jackie Chan. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see. Do you think the Yellow King in Carcosa is connected to the Baratheons and the Stormlands? Um, I don't see how they would be. I really don't. Hmm. Let's see. So when we're talking about Yi Ti, we're talking when we're talking about the Great Empire of the Dawn, we're talking about the oldest civilization in existence uh, in the real world. We know that China and those and Asian civilizations are some of the oldest in our world, so it's, it's reflected here. And it was it was one of the first place. It was the first like look how advanced they were from the get go, right? They built this great empire. They were the some of the first to learn writing and and you know skills, just just higher skills basically. Um, it wouldn't be I don't think it's far fetched to maybe think that they were influenced by some being from beyond the stars i mean people can believe that in the real world now i know i know people have ancient alien theories in the real world i don't think that actually happened but it's kind of believable like you like you can watch some of that some of those videos and be half convinced even though when you dig a little bit it falls apart but in a fantasy world i don't think it's very far-fetched um that you know they could they they were influenced by this great you know spirit that just wanted to help that just wanted to you know nurture humanity and guide them it says that they were guided out of the pits of savagery and into civilization so they were they were savage before um and then something happened and then they 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 became one of the greatest civilizations that's ever existed if not the greatest civilization that ever existed and i, I don't i think the legend that the Great Emperor of the Dawn ascended into the stars. I think that that's not something you should just gloss over. I think that you should really pay attention to that and really think about it. Because I think that is a hint at to as to what is really going on. Uh, Lucifer says, I think the Great Empire of the Dawn was like a was likely a multi-ethnic empire. I lost your comment. The ancestors of the ETH would surely have lived there. Okay, I understand. Oh, yeah. Well, that's an interesting way to... T I mean, if you look at Asia now, like, uh, or just look at China, uh, northern Chinese people look different from southern Chinese people. Everyone's Everyone looks different because it's, it's just genetic isolation. People in certain parts of the world will always look different. And when you have an empire this big, of course, it's going to probably encompass uh, groups of many different races. So I think I would agree with that. Um, San Rixian just gave me a super chat, and thank you so much for that. Um, they say, what do you think the great empire of the dawn people looked like? Were they, uh, Asiatic looking or am I thinking of the ET asking for artistic purposes? Well, I think, I think they, they looked like Asians. I like if, if I had, to, if I had to, 
if I, if, I mean, from what I've seen from the art and the way the buildings look and from the world of Ice and Fire, I think that they would probably look Asian. I don't think, I think when George R. Martin refers to the Great Empire of the Dawn, it is, it is the bulk of E.T. and then it's probably some other stuff, but I think they'd be Asian. I really do. I don't think that they would be another race. Asian, that's, 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 and then the word Asian too, like, that's one thing. The Russians, half of Russia is in Asia. So that so that's I mean kind of the the difference between Yeti and the Empire of the Dawn could kind of be the di like the difference between Asia and Yeti kind of because Russia is part of Asia so like people on the eastern side of Russia are technically Asians so think of it that way uh, do you think the Bloodstone Emperor was allied with or somehow worked with Old Gis um, I mean anything's possible. Uh, there's there's nothing solid that suggests one way or the other, but I I wouldn't straight up say no. Mm hmm. If a song of ice and fire truly reflected our world history, the oldest religion would probably be where old Gis is. I'd say. The oldest region would probably be where old Gis is, I would say. Well, I'm not I'm not I'm not a huge um historical geography person, so I would not I would not know. I really wouldn't. Uh, uh, Ashton Dragon says, Thanks for the vids. Your theories are interesting and the work you put into them into the vids makes and the work you put in makes the vids awesome. Well thank you so much. Uh, slow vomit says 95% of the popula population lives in West Russia, though. That is true. <laughs> but the ones that don't, yeah, are Asian. <laughs> uh, okay, Q&A. Do you think the Night King army will attack both sides? Book and show answer, please. Uh, show, definitely not. It looks like they've already come one way. And in the book, I think, yeah, why not? I think I think it would be super cool. It would throw everyone for, for a loop. Like suddenly, like we see a ladder from from old e from Ut, and the others have breached the fort or something, and they've marched that way too. It would kind of throw everything on its fucking head, and then it would make uh, Daenerys is what Quaithus told Daenerys make even more sense to go west. You must go east. She's, it's like stop looking that way, look that way, save this continent first. And I think that'd be very interesting. That would be a very cool twist on the entire thing. And I don't think many people would see it coming. And I, for one, would be ecstatic because, you know, it's something that I kind of thought of. So I, I'd love to see that happen in the book. And I think it's a possibility. I don't think it's as, I don't think it's as far-fetched as everyone seems to think it is. I really don't. I think there is a lot of evidence that um, supports that idea. And I've gone over that several times and I went over it in the video that we just watched um earlier uh do you think we will see any of the deep ones in game of thrones in the show probably not probably not um in the book probably not i don't think we're, i don't think they'll unless unless because i do have the idea that the bleeding sea contains the deep ones so if we get some if we get some more like mentions of them in the winds of winter like just like little mentions maybe they will show up in a dream of spring maybe the others will uh, breach the five forts and we'll see the deep ones rise out of the bleeding sea and and battle them <laughs> now that that would be very cool to see now that would that would definitely because i mean it, it would turn it into like a big fantasy thing it really would i mean it's already fantasy but it would go it would tip the scale and just go full out fantasy because right now it's still kind of a low magic fantasy but by that point it would be like lord of the rings type stuff going on we've got fish people fighting ice demons <laughs> But yeah, it's it's something that I'd like to see. We've had mention of the squishers already, um, and feast. So, and then dead things in the water. That you are correct. Dead things in the water. So, let's let's see how that goes. I mean, it's that's kind of another hint too. Dead things in the water. Could it? It could be. It could be reanimated deep ones. The others could have reanimated deep ones and have them fighting people. And that's what dead things in the waters water are. So, there we go. I hope that answers your question. Uh, do you think grayscale or gray sickness could play a role in taking down the Night King uh, and or army? Um, I don't know how it would. Um, 
unless grayscale is somehow poison to them like if someone with grayscale touches the night king he just dies but then i i mean i really don't get how unless i mean if everyone gets infected and then the white walkers magic doesn't work on people with grayscale but then everyone will be infected and they you know die still so i don't i mean i don't see how it could careful quinn george martin might take your ideas He's free to take them. If George Martin was, if George Martin wanted to take anything that I said, he's totally free to do it. I don't, I don't want anything for it. Take my ideas. You can tell, but I don't think he. I think he has his very, his own very well thought out ideas. And like I said, I would never say that anything that I think is going to happen. Any of my theories are one hundred percent definitely going to be right. I've never said that. I've never even claimed to think that. So, okay. I honestly love watching your videos and spent my whole birthday, which was yesterday, binge watching, catching up on all of your videos. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you so much, Kale and Anna King. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's see. Durin's god's grief married the storm god's daughter. The storm god is the enemy of the drowned god. Uh, what might happen if Euron met Stannis? I don't think Euron and Stannis would ever get along or be friends. Um, uh, Stannis is a very he, he's a very honor bound man, and he I think he'd view, he'd view Euron as you know a degenerate, as a cretin, as someone that you know and he, he wouldn't allow Euron to be king of the Iron Islands. I mean straight off the bat, Stannis would be like f that you're gonna bend the knee. So I don't think it would be a very friendly meeting because uh, I think Stannis would definitely be to your own be like submit he would call him a pretender um he wouldn't respect your at all and i think Euron mutually would look at he would look at stannis as kind of a stick in the mud just you know just you know, kind of an asshole that you know fuck that guy he's just kind of you know up his own ass and Euron wouldn't really have any respect for stannis either i don't think but I think Euron would ha would kind of have a layer of respect for Stannis as you know a military commander and for a commander and stuff like that. But I don't think Stannis would even give Euron that. Stannis would just be like, "You're a fucking pirate," and that's it. So yeah, it wouldn't be a very friendly meeting, I don't think. <laughs> um, grayscale may interfere with the bonds of magic that hold the White Walkers and Whites together. Uh, maybe. I mean, we don't know. But we, I, I, I have not predicted the purpose of Grayskull in the story yet. Uh, but if it goes anything like it did in the show... It, it, if Jorah did come to the Citadel in the book, as it did in the show, I, and Sam was there and Sam pulled that shit, I feel like instead of Sam curing Jorah in one night, that Grayskull would just become an epidemic and kill a bunch of people at the Citadel. <laughs> I feel like that would be the way it would happen because I don't think I don't George R. R. Martin is just not the type of person that's just like oh you got an uncurable disease let's cure it in in one night you know so we'll see the we'll see how the role of grayscale works and anyways what am I even saying anyways like I'm so I'm am I drunk Jorah does not have grayscale in the book it's it's John Connington so if John Connington went to the Citadel and you know for some reason wanted to get cured or something it would be like that but what i really think is going to happen is that john connington is just going to end up spreading it and that it's going to break out and it's going to be all over westeros so excuse me for that little blunder of show and book mixing up so <laughs> can never show my face in this town again <laughs> okay yeah but ye t Yiti and the Dawn Empire, the greatest civilization that's ever existed. Uh, Lama's Light Longstrider said that even the ruins um, are far greater than Westeros' ruins. Uh, it reminds me of kind of the United States versus, you know, Europe and whatnot, because in the United States, everything here is very young. Like, we don't have, like, the ancient ruins like you might have over in Europe. Everything's very young. Um, max some max max age something's gonna be is you know like two or three hundred years, and then Europe you've got like oh we live in a fifteen hundred dollar fifteen hundred year old house, <laughs> and I was like what the heck I can't even fathom something like that. Uh, when are you writing a book, Quinn? Well, I write all the time, and I I, I have several projects that I'm working on right now, but okay. Do you think that the two heroes died after they ended the long night? Probably. That was their end. 
Okay, Q and A. Why do you think uh, it soaks the light? And I think you're referring to the black stone. Um, um, I, that's just a property of this otherworldly stone. I don't. I mean that. It is. I mean, I can't say for sure. I mean, I. I think the cliche answer would be because it's dark and evil. But I can't say that for sure because I I just think it's a property of this otherworldly stone. That's just what it does. Um, it's in its nature. Um, I don't know. Stannis crushed the Victori uh, Victorian fleet. He is very smart. Oh, I think you're responding to someone else. Yes, Stannis. I think yes, Stannis is very smart. Stannis is whatever. You weren't talking to me, anyways. Okay. I didn't have any Patreon questions today because I, I posted it late and not a lot of people and people weren't able to see it. If you notice, the stream started an hour and a half late. It's usually 3.30, but we started today at 5, which is fine. At least I didn't cancel it. I do got one Patreon question, but it doesn't have anything to do with ET. And this is the Yellator, the Yellator tour. He says, I have a question. Are you writing a fantasy? And you need a map drawn. And it's funny because someone in the comment section of this video just asked a similar question. Um, well, I don't currently need any maps drawn yet. But if I ever do, then you'll be the first person that I contact. Uh, okay. How can fish people, giants, etc. exist and still be able to breed with humans? Are the races of this lore akin to real life humanoid species that went extinct? Like Neanderthals, Yeti. I think that is a huge possibility. Um, James Johnson and LaDonna, who, um, they have a channel called James of Thrones, and I really would like to get them on this podcast, so if you know, if you're, if you're a fan of James of Thrones, just go to his channel, and just be like, go on Ideas of Ice of Virus podcast, literally, just go to his channel right now, James of Thrones, and just go on his most recent video, and type, go on to Ideas of Ice and Fires Thursday podcast, just do that for me, but anyways, on his channel, they talked about how the children of the forest, the giants, everyone, were all technically human. They're all descended from humans, and that's how the interbreeding is available is able to occur. And that's, for the most part, what I think is going on. I think um, they are kind of like offshoots, like Neanderthals, Australopithecus. They can all breed together. Well, I don't think an Australopithecus could have bred with a Neanderthal, but that's... It's fantasy. Yeah, that's the way it goes. They say dragons are genderless. But I think they take the gender of their rider. What do you think? So that would make Drogon a female. I think they probably are gender genderless, and it just depends on what the need is for the time. And I think Daenerys should get on trying to figure out how to breed her dragons, too. Figure that shit out. Get them breed, and you can have an army of dragons. That's what she needs to do. What do you think happened to dragon to Dragonsteel? And Lightbringer, I think they still exist. I think they're hidden away somewhere. I think they're hidden away. You should try contacting Team Red Team Review and Preston Jacobs. Well, Preston Jacobs is really cool. Um, I've never um, spoken to him before, but he's a really cool guy. And yeah, uh, moving on. Do you think the people in E.T. have invented gunpowder? Probably. It came from... It, that was invented in China in the real world. So I think well, that might be something... Yeah, I mean, if we do... If the story does make that turn and we get a E.T. point of view and we see the battle from the other side in E.T., I think it would be really cool to see them use gunpowder to fight the others. Now, that is a thought that I just absolutely love. Uh, okay. I know this is unlikely, but would Stoneheart? But what would Stoneheart do if she met Littlefinger? Because um, she still doesn't know he betrayed them, does she? Um, I think that her suspicions would be elevated, <laughs> would be highly elevated. She would just see this man has always served House Lannister, and she'd be she'd be not she'd be so not for his bullshit. She'd be she'd be not hearing it. The fact that she did what she did to Brienne. Who is on her side? No, she would not trust Peter Baelish for an instant. Um, she would know that Lysa is dead. She would know that he married Lysa. She would know all of this. So, no, she he wouldn't be living. Uh, if, if Lady Stoneheart gets a hand of Peter Baelish, 
He's not getting out of it alive. No way. No way, sir. No way, so. And yeah, I think... Ye I wanted to talk about Yee-T today, too, because I know a lot of people... It's a, it's a kingdom that a lot of people don't really know about. People know about Game of Thrones. People that watch the show have never heard of Yee-T. And that's... I just really want to keep pushing the idea that this should be one of the spinoffs. Like, is anybody with me? Like, I need a Yee-T spinoff. I want the mystery solved. I want to know what happened, and, and I want to see the descent of, of Yee-T into chaos. I want to see the fracture of the Great Empire... Um, I want to see all of that occur on screen. I want to see the the Amethyst Emperor, em Empress, be killed by her brother and him usurping her, and how that affected the people of E.T. and how they reacted. And I want to see the wars being fought. And I just want to see it all. Uh, do, police don't bring guns into Game of Thrones. It doesn't have to be guns, but you know, maybe cannons or something. I mean, they could figure out some way to do it. They could figure out some way. So they they'd be like, oh, we got this stuff that explodes when you light it on fire. And we got these beings that um, got these beings that fire is really like their bane. Of course, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? To me, it is. Yeah. So if they've got it, they should use it. And if they're really, and since they're based off Asia, it's it's they probably have it. Quinn, what do you think is the most significant societal contribution or development to come from ET? Um, writing, I think probably is probably a big one, or just. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, just civilization and just higher thinking and learning in general. So it was, it's the dawn of civilization that we're talking about. These were the first civil, so just civilization itself, <laughs> civilization itself. It's not going to happen. It would spoil the mystery. They could still do it and keep it a little vague. I think they don't have to tell everything make it a little bit more cerebral and see that's where that's where i it starts to lose it because you would have to make something like et a little bit more cerebral and mysterious and then i think that would turn off the normies i know i'm an i'm, a, I'm an elitist motherfucker but it would it would turn off the normies they'd be like oh we don't like this is too smart it has to have a beginning middle and end it's like okay tangent time it's like everyone um bitching about the movie mother at this point Oh, it's it's pretentious and oh, it's boring and it, it it doesn't make sense and come on, mother is is an is an experience and it makes you uncomfortable and that's what it's supposed to do and it's supposed to be a mirror on humanity and that's what it is and you know art is not always supposed to make you feel good like that's just it art art sometimes makes you think and it sometimes leaves you empty and feel and feeling sad and i think that a song of ice and fire will leave leave us feeling empty and sad i really do it'll be bittersweet um um the suffering will end but you know there will be loss they will have suffered greatly and sacrificed a lot to get to where they are and it won't end like oh cheery and then and then, you know, we're moving on and things are just going to get fine immediately after. No, it's going to be hard and difficult in, in the centuries to come after the long night. It's not just going to get better immediately. I know. And that and I think that's part of what George R. Martin is trying to do to us. That's what he's trying to tell us. Do you think magic has become stronger in the story since Danny and John were born? Could this magic have made the Night King stronger, allowing him to create White Walker Bailey's to grow his army? I don't think that... Danny and John have anything to do with magic being stronger. I don't think that human beings are that significant in the in this huge giant scope of things. I don't think single singular people are, are just the bees knees like that. I think there's stuff that revolves around them. Like in the Wheel of Time, there are people that are quote unquote Talvirin. So the Wheel of Time, fate weaves itself around these people, and certain things are destined to happen around these people. Um. Yeah. But I don't think they're they're the reason that magic has returned. Q and A. Why is your whiny voice British? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's just something that I've always done. I I, I can't. I <laughs> now that you say it, I'm not hated on British people. If that's what you're trying to say, imagine Netflix using Marco Polo's crew and budget for a YT show. I'd love it. I freaking love it. Mother makes perfect sense. It's the entire meta metaphorical story of the Bible. Yes, I 100% agree. It, it, it was exactly that. And then it also had a bunch of themes about Mother Nature and the fact that we're 
destroying her and that she's screaming and trying to warn us and screaming that this is her house this is her home and we're destroying it and no one's listening and that's what that's what it was supposed to be about and people don't like that ugly mirror on the face of humanity and you know a lot of religious people have problems with it too um and i understand why but you know but is it, when you when you touch on topics like that then you get you're gonna piss off people you just have to do a dramatic reading of the child sewer orgy from Stephen King's It. All right, why do people can't let go of the of the orgy thing? Like it's not like it's not like it's just like some gratuitous thing. It's like it it is it, it's a bonding thing. It's like it's like a bonding ritual, and these children were lost in the tunnels, and, and not even children, but teenagers. They're teenagers at this point, and so I'm just like, I mean, it's natural part of. Uh, youth and childhood and experimentation and all that stuff like just get over it like people like people are very simple-minded when it comes to that I mean just stop running away from anything that's sexual or that makes you slightly uncomfortable and then that's that's another thing stop running away from things that make you uncomfortable and just see it for what it is and try to see what's amazing about it you know whatever <laughs> do you think that the children of the forest and the people of Narth might be related because they share similarities like yellow eyes, small stature, and being one with nature. Um, do you mean Nath? The people of Nath? Uh, and, and, yeah, maybe. But probably not. I think the children of the forest originated in Westeros. I think they were there, and that's where they come from. They're on Westeros. Okay, since the hero of legend came and saved the world before... What evidence is there there that a new hero will be the last? Is it a repeating event like the alignment of a constellation? Okay, I very much like that sentiment. That it, like the sentiment that it, this is something that will repeat on a cycle. Yes, I definitely agree. This is a cycle that goes on and on, constantly maintaining balance, resetting the flow of things, maintaining balance. It's a constant cycle. And so, yes, I, I definitely feel like it's just going to keep happening again and again and again. And, you know, that's kind of, if I have to go back to the Wheel of Time, Robert Jordan, a great fantasy writer, um, an archetype fantasy writer, really. Um, and his series, that's, that's the deal, too. The Wheel of Time, it keeps going. It weaves over and over and over and over again. Um, uh, truth becomes legend, legend becomes myth, and it, 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 and it just starts over and over and over again. It's a cur current cycle. The same souls even recycled over and over and over again. Mm hmm. Let's see. Love Wheel of Time. Yes, the Wheel of Time. I definitely recommend. That's definitely on the list of books that I recommend to a Song of Ice and Fire people. If you want to get, you know, an idea of. If you want to, it's kind of less, it's like way less adult than a, than a Song of Ice and Fire. But if you want to see where George R. Martin gets some, at least some of his ideas from, check out The Wheel of Time because he definitely takes stuff from Robert Jordan. Okay. Will the Church of the Starry Wisdom have a role to play in the future of the story? I think that, um, well, me and LML discussed um, once that Marwin and Quaith might actually be involved with the Church of the Starry Wisdom, which I think is a very interesting idea. So... Um, maybe they already have had a role to play. Because uh, Quaith and Marwin, the fact that they both have glass candles, that seems to indicate that they are a part of some organization together. But the, the thing about the church, though, is that they worship Narlatep in, in Lovecraftian lore, who is the haunter of the dark. Um, he is, he's a, one of the great old ones. Um, so, yeah. So take that how you will. So are they are they necessarily a good thing or like what's going on with them? They're wor they're worshiping some dark god. Um, have you read Roger Zelani Zelani's book Lord of Light, which Martin loves and says on his website was huge for him, has the potential to have influence a Song of Ice and Fire themes. Men become gods in this book. Very interesting. I will have to check it out. I haven't, but I will check it out definitely. Do you think magic will fade away? by the end of the books. Um, that's a common sentiment that a lot of people have, and it, it would contribute to the bittersweet ending that George R. Martin has been hinting about um, for a very long time. So, 
I mean, I see the. I mean, I could definitely see it as a possibility. I could see the dragons dying, and the, this is magic fleeing the world yet again, um, perhaps to return some other time. Yeah. So thanks. And again, I just have to say, if you are watching this stream and you are enjoying what you're watching, please, 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 uh, leave a like. It really helps out the video as far as uh, visibility a lot. I you know. <laughs> I post I post live streams and people have already disliked them before I've even <laughs> before I've even started the streams. I know like people are going to these videos and just being like, "Oh, it's this guy. Fuck him." Just like <laughs> so, it really helps counteract that by throwing in your support with a like. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Is your own involved with the Church of the Starry Wisdom? I think they're they're. It definitely could be a possibility that Euron is. Um, it doesn't fit into my main Euron theory, but I, I mean, I, as an alternate theory, Euron being influenced by the Church of the Starry Wisdom and kind of doing their will, it kind of it kind of fits what he's doing. He's, he's sacrificing to some queer god, it seems like. It Could it be Narlathotep? Could it be? I mean, I don't know if it's literally Nar Narlathotep that they worship in A Song of Ice and Fire, but that's who they worship in Lovecraftian lore. But we will see. It definitely fits. Okay. Mm hmm. People are asking me about different authors. I have not read any Andrew Norton, but it has been rec he's been recommended to me before. Okay. Did Cat have a long term affair with Edmure? Which is why most of Ned's children have red hair and blue eyes. Okay, like, <laughs> I think you might be taking the incest thing a little bit too far. I don't think so. I don't think that cat was banging her brother. No, I really don't. Okay. I want it to end horribly. If it ends badly and the White Walkers win, that would only further solidify that A Song of Ice and Fire is a one-of-a-kind series. And I said before that if this series ended with the others taking over and ruling Westeros. It would not, in the in the least bit, um, contradict anything that's in the, in the story before. It would not contradict the feel of Martin's writing. It would be such a Martin thing to do, to have the others be the winners in the end. And it would it'd be, it'd be a fantasy series like no other. Like, holy, the main antagonist from the very beginning wins, and the good guys are killed, and the others rule. You know, it would blow everybody's mind, and I—I I, that's something that I would <laughs> very much enjoy. Um, I would definitely keep recommending it. But um, something like that, something that major would probably be spoiled in the show, which would kind of be sad, because I, I can almost guarantee you that they wouldn't do it nearly as good as how um, Martin would do it in his books. Okay. Is there snow in the Grey Waste? Um, presumably, yeah. It's frozen, and that's part of why it's the Grey Waste, yeah. There's de I, I, I definitely imagine the snow. I imagine snow. Probably gets snowier as you move further and further east. But I, I imagine that it's drier in the beginning and then snower as it continues. Okay, so Fry Davis, thank you so much for your super chat. And I will read that question. Let me just open that up. I'm waiting for it to load. <laughs> okay, here we go. Fridays, thank you so much for your super chat. If the children of the forest were native to Westeros, then who are the Ifriquin who dwelled in the forest south islands of Ib, page 298 of the World of Ice and Fire? Well, they could be some out offshoot. I mean, I may maybe they maybe they weren't initially from Westeros. Maybe they came from some other part. Um, of the world and then later inhabited Westeros. I can't say for sure that they inhabited Westeros initially. I really can't. Um, but I think they'd been there for a while. Um, maybe some of the children of the forest that were on Westeros left and went to um, Ib. Or maybe the maybe they're originally from Ib. Uh, who knows? But maybe they are. I, maybe these are two separate groups of beings that just happen to evolve uh, similarly. So... There's a lot of mystery to be solved, so I can't, I can't, you're right, I can't just straight up say that they are definitely native to Westeros. 
because like you said there's evidence of people that are very similar in ib mm -hmm. and then the people of uh nath too are similar as someone mentioned earlier but they'd be more the result of human children hybrids i think Mm -hmm. You should start a web series of discussions reading of the World of Ice and Fire. Um, no, the Wheel of Time. Wheel of Time. Well, if I could get enough interest, you can see that's that's the thing that I always have to think about is, you know, the interest of, uh, are, you know, are people going to watch? Are people going to enjoy it? And, you know, people that have never read the Wheel of Time, are they going to give it a try? I'm doing the Dune thing, and I'm really putting a lot of effort and time into it. And I'm hoping that people get behind that because I have made videos on Dune in the past and they've been relatively successful and they've been like shared on Reddit and stuff like that in, in Dune Reddit, the Dune Reddit over on, on uh, the Dune subreddit, you know, over on the website, people have shared my Dune videos and, you know, they've taken them well and they've liked them. So I'm hoping that th that video is successful. And then if they are, then maybe I will move on to doing some Wheel of Time stuff. I have narrated the Wheel of Time uh, a little bit. I've narrated the Shadow Prophecy, so that's in my narrations on my chap on my channel. It's in the narrations playlist. And also on Patreon, I do have a video up where I do discuss the Wheel of Time a bit. So that is up. And like I always say, you can check out my Patreon for extra content. And there's some new stuff going up in a few days on Patreon too. I make sure I upload at least two pieces of content every month. And so that's and that's um, up there too. And I do discuss the Wheel of Time, so you can check that out on there, or you can listen to that short clip of the Shadow Prophecy that I have. Okay. People in Westeros are horrible. At least the others don't rape their victims or kill babies. I mean, you have a point. You kind of have a point. But then again, legend does kind of say that the others did kill babies. So, like even babes, like old Nan says, even suckling babes found no pity in them. So, but, you know, then again, history is written by the victors. So maybe mankind in those legends painted the others as worse than they really were. We don't know. Um, do you think the last hero and Azora High met before they died probably not i don't think these heroes any of them met i think the names just kind of blended together um. mm -hmm. let's see there is a tin foil theory i just came across it basically says that it basically says that maybe the princes Princess, princess, who was promised is meant that they were betrothed to the others. Unlikely. So the prince that was promised is someone that was promised to the others, and, and you know, the others are mad because mankind is late on the promise, and they're, so they're coming to collect the princess, who may be Daenerys or John or both. <laughs> now that's an interesting idea. If in the end, you know, Daenerys or someone gets carried off into the kingdom, into the land of Always Winter, I know she's to be the bride of. Uh, the Night King or whoever. No, I can. I kind of like that theory. It's kind of effed up, and it's kind of my taste. But who knows? Like George R. Martin could write. George R. Martin. I'm like nine times out of ten that George R. Martin is going to write something on that page, and it's just going to shock the heck out of me. And I'm just going to have to rethink all of my theories. And you know, and I'm just looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to what George R. Martin does, because I really think it can go so many different places. And that's just the beauty of this world that he's built, and the beauty of the world that he that he's set up for us to enjoy. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think the others are just simple evil creatures. I think the children of the forest are their puppet masters and are way more complex. Well, we will see. I, I do think the children of the forest had something to do with the creation of the others. But I think it was more like the others do have a mind of their own and a will of their own. And that they got out of hand. They became something that even the children of the forest couldn't control. And I don't think that it's simplistic evil. And the reason that I don't think that it's simplistic evil... I do think they're operating separately from the children at this point. But the reason that I don't think they're simply simplistic evil... Is because it's simply just George R. Martin hates that trope. He always criticizes Tolkien 
about uh, or he makes a note that, you know, the orcs are just evil just for the sake of being evil and they really have no depth to them. And I don't think that's the story that George R. Martin is trying to tell. Even if they are just the puppet masters, I do think that they have wills of their own and they're not just we want to kill everybody just because. I think it's part of their nature to kind of reject humanity just at the very core. They just kind of reject life, all life. But they're a different kind of existence. They are not like us. And in a way, we kind of reject them. We can't live while, while they live. We can't live while they live. We can't coexist. It's impossible. It's physically impossible. Does it make that does, does that make us evil? Because we you know, it doesn't. I mean they're they're simply just another race that is there to protect themselves and to exist. I think the promise is a betrothal. Well be very, very interesting. We we will see. We got we got two books to go. We got two books to go, guys, and and we'll see how George R. Martin, how George R. Martin does it. Very, very, very good. Um, are you sympathetic with Euron equals Dario theory? Of the tinfoil theories, I find it to have the most evidence. I don't think Euron is Dario. I, I'm not. I'm not. That's not one that I can really get behind. I just really don't get. I really can't get behind it. I think it would be ridiculous if they have little towns and societies where baby others walk around. Their army is made up of zombies and they kill everything. Um, I don't think they're. I don't think they can reproduce in that way. I don't think they have babies walking around. I don't think that's the way they reproduce. But maybe I think. I think the way they live probably is is so different from the way humans live that you probably wouldn't even be able to really comprehend. Or it's it's it'd be like it'd be like oh is that really living you know what I mean they don't they don't they don't have needs or desires that humans have so I don't know if they didn't necessarily need a city to live in but I know they have a place where they reside which I'm hoping that we see because Martin has said that more about the the uh, the nature of the others the White Walkers will be revealed in the next book and I'm definitely looking forward to that. So we've been going for about an hour and a half. So we'll give it another 15 minutes uh, or so. And then we will end this stream here. But if you guys have any more questions, feel free to um, type them now. And let's see. What else can I say about the Empire of the Dawn and Yi-T and the Bloodstone Emperor that hasn't already been said? Um... It's all very vague in the world of Ice and Fire. We don't really know the details. There's a lot of mystery, as I said, and that's part of what makes it so interesting. And, of course, we can see the parallels between him and other legendary figures like the Night King. Um, I even, at one point in time, compared Patchface to the Night King because, you know, according to the legend, the fisher folk say that he gave his seed to a merling. And with it, I assume I, I said that maybe he even gave her a soul. And that's why he's kind of the messenger of the drowned god at this point. And that would kind of go back to the Night King giving his soul to the other woman. And, you know, you know, worshiping those dark gods. And then, you know, we got Euron. We've got Euron now who is will eventually have a bride assumingly like the, the pale woman with the fire in her hair or whoever she was from the vision and he he and i feel like his story parallels the bloodstone emperor in in ways as well it's being it's just now being set up right um the blood eye and bloodstone like i said before and things like that mm -hmm. um, will we get the full armies from the veil in the show they said only 2,000 men from the Vale in Winterfell. Well, well, we'll need them. I think it would be it would be a mistake not to not to use the men of the Vale to fight the greatest threat that's ever faced humanity. Um, do you subscribe to the theory that the Amethyst Empress is Danny's ancestor? Um, someone brought this up earlier. I said that I don't deny that it's a possibility, but um, I, I feel like it could it could be true or it could not or it might not be true. 
So it's not something that I'm just outright rejecting. Uh, will the others uh, slash Night King have any form of dialogue with humans in the books to come? I think so, and I think it may even come through Bran, um, through a more um, within something that's within the mind, right? I think that Bran may interface with you know the kind of the consciousness of the others, right? And you know it'll be that way. And I also imagine kind of an internal battle. Um, between Bran and the others, you know, that's going on within his mind. Something that would be very difficult to portray on screen, but something that George R. R. Martin could do in a book. Um, uh, LML has the idea that the others themselves exist within the Werewood net, so that would be an avenue for that to happen if you go by that theory. But I don't, I don't even disagree. But I don't. Um, but I think that it could also go that Bran sends out his consciousness and finds the others and communicates that way. And we get some information that way. Because it seems like if we're going to get some insight into the way the others really work, that Bran is a good candidate to do so. Since he is kind of very magical and has you know powers. And can leave his body and throw his soul somewhere else. Um, what do you think of Hiram the Black? Here's a theory. Uh, there's a theory that the Lobstons went, um, are his, are his descendants through Red Heron. Um, interesting theory. Um, I think Heron the Black is an interesting figure. Um, I talk a little bit about him. Uh, what video was that? Uh, in one of my theory, in one of my theory videos from like two years ago, and it's one of my very earliest ones, and I talk a lot about, um, Heron the Black in that one. But yeah, um... Q and A. Before Rhaenyra, um, there were there were six dragons. Then it spiked to eighteen um, when she came to power. Then all the dragons died. Um, then all the dragons died when she died. Why is that? Uh, not sure. Maybe some Targaryens are good for the health of dragons. Um, and that seem that I mean that seems to be in it, that seems to me to be implied with Daenerys that the fact that she is. Um, caressing these dragon eggs and she's always around them that's what helped bring them to life maybe it has something to do with her blood or this particular set of genes that um, only comes along once in a while that help the dragons to be born and helps the dragons to prosper and grow how many times did the long night happen um, why now I still can't understand I don't think it's a stretch to say that the Long Night happened a, a few times. The Five Forts are there. The Five Forts were there before the original Long Night. And the story for why they're there is to keep the Lion of Night from the realms of men. I mean, come on. It, it, that, that there suggests that it happened before. Um, it happened again. And it will happen again. It's about to happen now. That to me suggests all of that. I think that it's happened at least twice before. I don't think it's a stretch to say that the Long Night might have happened twice before. I really don't. Any plans on doing videos about the Cimmeriliad and Lord of the Rings? Um, eventually, eventually, I, I do. I, I do have a lot of fun with Tolkien's work, but right now, my main focus on this channel are going to be Dune, Stephen King, and A Song of Ice and Fire. So uh, that's that's what I'm going to be doing. And then mainly a song of ice and fire. Like when I when I started this channel out, all I did was a song of ice and fire, and now I'm very happy that I can move on to other things. And I'm I'm, I'm glad that I found an audience with you know the people that like my Stephen King readings and the people that have been asking for Doom for so long. And I really think you're gonna enjoy uh, what I give you as far as Doom is concerned. Um, so yeah. So Lord of the Rings may be coming in the future. Do you think that John will look more Valyria, Valyrian when he comes back to life? Um, I'm not even. I've said this before. I'm not even 100% sure that Jon Snow will come back in John in his own body. I think that he might even have to take someone else's body because his body does have like a bunch of stab wounds in it. But it depends on the length of time because we know Thoros of Mirror can be brought back from the dead and he's riddled with stab wounds, so we don't know. Um, but we, I don't. Th I don't think his appearance is necessarily going to change. I know some people think that he's going to come out with white hair, but I don't. I don't think it's going to happen. It would make his name Snow kind of fit more, though. John Snow with white hair. Mm -hmm. 
I have a 10-hour drive coming up this weekend. Should I listen to Dune on audiobook or The Call of Cthulhu? Well, The Call of Cthulhu is quite short, so it will, it will end before your 10-hour drive. But you can listen to Dune, and I'm, I'm certain that the an audio version, version of Dune will last more than well over 10 hours. So I, I guess give Dune a try, and then it'll blow your mind. And get lost in the world, but not too lost because you got to pay attention to driving. So, <laughs> uh, wakes up with white hair, very Twin Peaks. Ah, oh, you're, you're quite right. You're quite right. It's very Twin Peaks. Very, very Twin Peaks. Interesting. Okay, guys. Okay. I neither think George R. Martin will live to finish A Dream of Spring, nor that he could wrap up the series in only two more books in the first place. Uh, the unfinished status of A Song of Ice and Fire will define it. Well, that's a very pessimistic outlook that a lot of people have about A Song of Ice and Fire. And, you know, I used to get very mad when people used to say this, but now I'm just kind of like, I get it. People, people are speculating about George R. Martin's death and whatever. But I, I honestly do, I can say this on record, I honestly do feel like The Winds of Winter will be out. It will be out soon. The Winds of Winter is out. And I honestly think that it will take much less time for him to write A Dream of Spring than The Winds of Winter. Because I feel like Winds of Winter is all these loose strings that are all coming together. And he's got to make all the decisions to set in what is canon and what is not. And then Dream of Spring will kind of be the resolution and will finish everything off. So I think the ending will come swifter than The Winds of Winter. And, and The Winds of Winter, this book... Is probably going to be longer than a dance with dragons so it's it's taken some time and i i'm hoping that and i'm sure that george R. martin read the criticism i've seen the criticism of feast and dance so he doesn't want to make something that's going to disappoint the fans he wants to make something that's um what he wants it to be it's his magnum opus he has to make it perfect he's going to take his time with it period like i always say frank herbert wrote 20 dune books well, not 20 Dune books. Frank Herbert wrote six Dune books over the course of 20 years. So masterpieces take time to write. And that's just, just what that's just what you got to do. And Frank Herbert died before he could finish Dune. And it's very sad. And we, we can only just hope that it doesn't happen with George. And that's all I can say. And, and George R. Martin has said that, you know, it kind of pisses him off when people speculate on his death anyways. So I kind of try and refrain from doing that when I can. But guys... I think it is about time that I wrap up this stream. We went for about an hour and a half um, on Yeeti. Um, the Empire of the Dawn, the Bloodstone Emperor, um, a great kingdom. And I'm looking forward to that miniseries. Uh, thanks everyone so much for joining me on the stream. Like I said, streams every Thursday at 3.30. This one was late. Um, peace out everyone. Uh, make sure you like this video if you enjoyed it. Please, please like. Like I always say, follow me on Twitter. Um, I always interact with people on Twitter um, and, and other social media like Facebook. Check out my Patreon for extra content. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for being here and listening to me talk about this for an hour and a half. I had a lot of fun. And I'll see you guys next week. And be on the lookout for those Dune videos. Peace out. <laughs> Thank you.